let me welcome Shane Hasty for our very first talk. Uh, let me tell you about him a little bit. He is the director of Agile Learning Programs in IC Agile. So thank you so much, Shane, for joining us today. So over to you, Shane. Thanks, Ashan. And welcome, everybody. I'm really glad that you've, you've joined us. Uh, obviously, for me, it is late at night. I'm in New Zealand, so, and uh, we might have some connection cha uh, challenges because of that. I noticed that uh, a couple of people have note, uh, are saying that the sound is not great. Um, that's probably going to be linked to the just the connections that we have. Um, but uh, hopefully, you'll still be able to, to get value. Right. So I have shared my screen at this point, which I hope everybody can see the uh, my talk. The, the golden age of agile coaching. And what I want to talk about is what coaching is and what it in, isn't. Because I firmly believe that there's a lot of misconceptions and unfortunately a certain level of harm being done in the agile community at the moment through less than effective coaching and in fact through some, some coaching that is uh, not really coaching. So we want to talk about what the discipline of coaching is and then what agile coaching is. Um, we'll explore Lisa Adkins' work on the domain of agile coaching. And then I want to talk about the competencies of an agile coach and relate that to the journey towards mastery of Shuhari. Uh, I'll introduce powerful questions. Um, in a session like this, we won't do much practice with them, um, but uh, I hope to leave you with something to, to think about. And to round it out, I want to talk about my own journey, and I'll weave some of that in as we're going. Um, my journey from a practitioner and uh, a developer, a, um, a business analyst, through to a teacher, a facilitator, and to a coach, and to being assessed as an expert coach by other expert coaches and the, the competency-based framework that IC Agile provides for um, coaching as, as a journey and as a, as a discipline and as a path towards mastery. So, so that's where we want to go over over the next little while. The first point is what is professional coaching? And the, the definition from the uh, International Coaching Federation, which is a, a, a professional body, they talk about coaching as partnering with clients in a thought provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional development. Sorry, personal and professional potential. So coaching is not telling somebody what to do. It is not giving them advice. Coaching is exposing the creative process that is in the coachee, whether that coachee is an individual or a team, and helps them, helping them to, to uncover their own understanding. And there's some important aspects to professional coaching. First and foremost is there are ethical guidelines and professional standards. So coaching is a, a discipline that requires ethics, professionalism, and a code of conduct that as a professional coach, the certainly under the auspices of the ICF, you are expected to commit to and to submit yourself to the discipline, uh, the disciplinary process of that organization. So if you're acting outside of the, the bounds of professional coaching, then you submit yourself 
and, and there's a disciplinary process, there's a complaints process. And like the, the strong professions, you know, med medicine and law, law and so forth, coaching has that same ethical standard and uh, ethical guidelines and strong professional standards. It's about building a trust relationship with your coachee. And, and that trust is the key to effective coaching. There's um, an aspect of presence. And the key area there is that when you are working in with somebody in a coaching relationship, that you are focused with and in the instant with that person. You're, you are fully present and you're, you're engaging them with your whole being. The effective communication and communication skills are absolutely crucial. And it's about facilitating learning and results. And a really scary one for some people, it's actually taking accountability for the outcome. As the coach, you are not in a position of all care and no responsibility. Your role is to support the, your coachees and to be with them on their journey to professional development in, in whatever area that, are, that, that journey takes them. And what I see in the agile coaching community is very little of this ethical standard, uh, professional st professionalism, and whole and the accountability. In fact, very, very often I hear agile coaches not wanting to take accountability for the outcomes. My job is not to make sure that they, the team delivers, it's to help the team. No, that is not the case. I am there to, to own the outcome along with the team. So coaching is very much a partnership and it's a process where the coachee is actually in the lead in terms of discovering what is best for them and a way to explore options and opportunities. Coaching is not giving advice. That's consulting. Coaching is not learning from an experienced professional. That's mentoring. And coaching is never a quick fix. The coaching relationship is lengthy and sustained and it's about seeing people through a journey so that's professional coaching as a broader discipline but there's there's a subset of professional coaching that is the agile coaching and lisa atkins has uh, drawn up this uh, competencies framework You'll hear it sometimes talked about as a butterfly that looks at what a, an agile coach, what are the competencies that an agile coach needs to have? And we start with, they need to be an experienced and capable agile or lean practitioner where they apply the agile values and principles in their lives, in every aspect. So they are the, the person that the, the team can talk to, can, can turn to, and they can see the values, the principles, the practices in action through everything that that person does. Then we need professional coaching competencies, partnering with clients in that creative pro process to inspire their personal and professional potential. So this is the, the competencies that we were talking about, about earlier on. We also need facilitation skills. Facilitating is different to coaching. And as an agile coach, you will move in and out of the facilitator role, of the coach role, and also of the two roles on the left, the teacher and the mentor. And you need to be able to convey your knowledge in ways that other people can pick them up. And that's the, the teaching 
as well as the mentoring. Mentoring is a, a one on one relationship, typically sharing knowledge and and providing providing that advice. But that when you're doing that, you are not coaching, but you're acting within this coaching framework. On top of all of these or supporting all of these, you need competencies in the technical business or transformation area. And realistically, it would be it's unusual to see one person having deep competencies in all three of these areas. Uh, technical mastery. If we're in the in, in the domain of building software, this is the person who can teach, mentor, guide, coach, and support the team as they bring in the strong technical practices. So this would would be somebody with a with a, a, a strong and deep technical background who can walk the talk of the technical mastery. There's also a need for people with the business mastery, with value-driven innovation, the, the product ownership, the product mindset, the, the um, value stream thinking, able to share their experiences and mentor, guide, and coach people in that innovation and product development space product ownership, product management. And the, th the third of the competencies is the transformation mastery. This is people who bring a depth of knowledge about organizational change and organizational design uh, that, that act as the, the catalyst working at the most senior levels in organizations. Now, it's pretty unusual to see somebody who has deep competencies in all three of those supporting areas. For myself, I feel that I'm, I'm very strong in the business mastery space. I understand the transformation mastery and I can talk to a certain extent and have worked at that level with some organizations, but I'm not a deep expert in that space. And technical mastery, not so much anymore. Uh, I used to be a programmer, but I haven't written code in anger since 2009. So I, while I can talk with the technical team and understand the concepts, I don't have the current up-to-date skills that really would equate to that technical mastery. So if you're thinking about being a coach, being an agile coach for a team, Look at these areas and think about what are the ones that I currently have competencies in? What are the ones that I need to build competency in? And where are the ones that I need to go and get deliberate practice? Go and, uh, go and study, go and explore, go and learn, and then build up those strengths. Because if you, if you don't bring the right competencies, the bright, right mindset, with you in your coach's toolkit, then you can do harm to teams. And if you're not able to be a coach, please don't pretend. It's not good. Think about those 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 ethical uh, requirements and the the code of conduct for being an effective coach. And it's also important that we understand where is our scope. What is the scope of work? And really, really important is that scope starts with knowing yourself. A good coach, an experienced coach, is, is somebody who truly has held the mirror up and continues to hold the mirror up to themselves and to, to challenge themselves. They recognize their own biases and their own um filters when they're exploring when they uh, and they're able to to know their own triggers and say okay i need to to manage and to control my responses and behaviors and to and to know why they react that gives them the ability to interact with individuals and a lot of our work as coaches 
starts at working with individuals and then moving up to the team. And if we if we look at that uh, breadth of coverage, you now the team facilitation activities, those start with self, go to individuals and go to the team. Then the, the agile coach sits in that team and program level. And then there's a different set of competencies. These are the, the people who are strong in the transformation mastery area that is about enterprise agile coaching. And there, there's a big jump and a significant dif uh, difference in skill sets. So just because you've been a team level agile coach for a period does not qualify you to become an organization level enterprise coach either. So it's, a, it's about recognizing, knowing your own levels of competency and the areas that you can work with and being self-aware enough to say, you know what, I'm not the right person to coach in this context and to, to bring somebody else to bring the, the people with the right competencies in to support you. So coaching often ends up being a team, a community who are supporting the, 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 the teams and the organization. And there is a pathway. And this pathway, uh, this is the IC Agile view. There, there are certifications. There's knowledge-based certifications that are available to you. And IC Agile has three on the coaching journey. The first one is the IC Agile Certified Professional. That's the foundational knowledge of Agile. And anybody working in an Agile environment should have this knowledge. And, and this is an important distinction I'm making here that about knowledge versus competency. We start with knowledge and, and the, the foundational agile knowledge. Then we start to build some experience. We're starting to, to exercise the agile muscles. And now we, we get to a point where, you know what? I want to support other people. I'm ready in my journey to become a team facilitator, a, a scrum master, if you will, in, in the scrum language. But I'm ready to be that servant leader to, to support other people. And that's the, the team facilitation. Again, in the IC Agile world, there is a certification and there is a knowledge, a set of knowledge that you need to acquire to be able to facilitate teams. And, and uh, like with the, the basic agile muscles, you now start to exercise the facilitation skills and you move from the novice to the practitioner. And then as a coach, if, you are, if you've been in that facilitation role and it's exciting and it's enjoyable and it's something that you truly want to, you can see yourself serving and supporting others because coaching is about bringing up the best in other people. The coach disappears. It's the team. It's the coachee who we look to support and, pro and, and promote them as the, the ones who get the benefit and who, and who achieve the outcomes. And in the IC Agile world, we have the ICPACC, and this is a very, very popular certification. Almost too popular. There are many, many people who've done a three-day training class, and they call themselves coaches. You are not a coach when you've completed a three-day training class. What you have done is acquired some knowledge. In the Shuhari, you are now a novice as a coach. You may be re in the technical practices. You may be re in transformation mastery. You may be re in the uh, business product management stuff. But you are a shoe level coach. And what's really important is do not hold yourself up as I am a coach 
when all you are is a novice. I am learning to be a coach. I am on a pathway towards becoming a coach. And you begin that with deliberate practice where you go and spend time working with teams, supporting them, ideally under the guidance and with the, uh, the support and help of a very experienced coach, somebody who can truly mentor you in your coaching journey. Because as coaches, we need guidance. We need to be part of a community. And it's through that community interaction, through our experience with teams, that we build up now the coaching muscles. And we also encourage you strongly to go and build additional skills, to learn things that are beyond the, the knowledge pathway of the, these three, ICP, ATF, and ICP, ACC, and, and ICP. There's, there's more knowledge out there. So doing something like the, uh, one of the, the, the International Coaching Federation certifications, learning that those deep crafts of coaching. And as you build skills, you get to a point where, you know what? I can prove competency to a group of my peers. And that is the, in the IC Agile world, that's the IC Agile expert certification. And the competency, the, the, that, that expertise is assessed not by an examination, but by a live session with existing experts. And they are the ones who are saying, yes, this person has shown the competencies that are defined in the rubric for an IC Agile expert in coaching. But even at that level, you're an experienced practitioner. There's a long way still to go of continuing practice deep, deepening your knowledge, widening your knowledge to become truly an effective master practitioner coach at the re level. So think about that pathway and think about where you are right now and where you want to go in that pathway. And this, this is a journey of years. It is not a journey of weeks and months. And are you prepared? Are you committed to that journey? I've railed against the ICPACC people coming out of that and saying that they are coaches. They've got the base knowledge to become coaches at that point. But there's something that happens to us. And the Dunning-Kruger effect identifies it. It talks about what happens when we acquire some knowledge. Fairly early on, once you've learned something new, you gain a level of confidence, which is the, the peak of Mount Stupid. Uh, the, I know enough to be dangerous, but it feels like I know everything. And then fairly rapidly, what happens as we start to apply this knowledge is we learn that actually um, what I thought I knew and that book, it wasn't quite right for this context. So we need to, and we fall into this valley of despair of, oh, I thought I knew, but now I realize there's so much more to learn. And then we climb what they call the slope of enlightenment. As we practice, as we uh, apply our skill and knowledge, and we move towards those uh, in the Shuha Ri space where, where we're becoming a high level practitioner. And we get to a plateau of sustainability where we truly have acquired the knowledge. But what's really interesting is we never have the same level of confidence, dare I say arrogance, about our competencies as we did at the beginning at the, at the peak of Mount Stupid. So 
when you hold the mirror up, when you think about your own competencies in this discipline, explore for yourself, are you moving through the slope of enlightenment or am I still at Mount Stupid? where I believe that my book knowledge, that, the, that what I have learned is enough? Or have you humbly taken on, there's a lot more still to, still to learn, the recognition that learning never ceases. I mentioned the expert certification. And what is really good, and the, the, the authors of the ICHR Learning Outcomes and of the, the, the uh, expert rubric have been incredibly generous because all of these learning outcomes and this rubric are freely available. They're created as, as creative commons, and they talk about the disciplines and the competencies that people need to acquire to become proficient, to become expert in these practices. And there are the five areas of facilitating the agile practice, professional coaching, coaches, the mentor or steward of teams, coaches, teacher, and understanding the agile coach roles. And these are areas that I would encourage you to think about and explore in your own journey. Where am I? Where do I want to go? Go and, and have a look at the uh, the learning outcomes, they're freely available on the IC Agile website, icagile.com. Download them and think about how would you exhibit those competencies. And one of those competencies is the concept of being able to ask powerful questions. So if you think of coaching as a, a, a technique, a mechanism to uh, explore with somebody there and allow them to uncover the solution that they already have, to find their own journey rather than you giving them the journey, then one of the techniques of that is this concept of powerful questions. And there are a number of, uh, well, there are many different powerful questions, but they all have things in common. They're open-ended, and they invite curiosity and exploration. So here are some examples. What, what do, do you want to have happen? What might be holding you back? What would the ideal outcome look like? So think of yourself asking these questions of a coachee and them deeply exploring this. A scary one. What are you willing to give up to achieve this outcome? On the other hand, some not particularly great questions are, have you tried that? Or why is this a problem? Or why did you do that? <laughs> Can you do this? Or think about that. Anything where you are providing the, your own biased answer prevents your coachee from becoming an effective learner. Now, in a face-to-face -face session, we'd, I'd actually get you to do some practice of this, but uh, uh, for a session like this, I want you to consider it. And there are some examples. The, um, all of these slides are available on, uh, on SlideShare, so please feel free to download them and use these questions. Consider so these examples of different types of powerful questions and how you would use them and work with people. So uh, just one simple set, and the, the reference there to the clean language stuff from Judy Reese, I would, would encourage you to explore that as well. So think about the competency of asking powerful questions and think how, what were the, the types of questions that we're prone to, answer, uh, to asking and they tend not to be the powerful questions, unfortunately. So the learning journey, I showed the, uh, the three certifications in the IC Agile pathway. 
ICP, team facilitation, coaching, and then at the top of the pathway, the, the IC Agile expert. And let me tell you about my journey. So I'm, I've been a practitioner and trainer for 30, 33, 34 years. Actually, it's 35 years now. And I was, I've worked in many, many roles in information technology. And about five, five and a half, five, six years ago, I started looking at coaching as a part of my career. And I built the practice of being an agile coach. I got the certifications, the, uh, the ICP, the ATF, and the ACC. Uh, I was even teaching the classes. But what I didn't have was that deep, deep experience. And it took me four years to build the coaching muscles to be competent. And at the same time, I was looking at gaining other knowledge. So the coaching for results uh, competencies that I training that I achieved at the University of Victoria in Wellington. Uh, the, a lot of my work was focused on teaching, so training from the back of the room as a practitioner, a certified trainer, and uh, things like the power to train. So I was building up those, those muscles, those not, adding to that knowledge. And then in December 2017, I felt I was ready. I've got enough experience, I've got enough knowledge, I can take the ICP ACC, the ICAC, sorry, the expert certification. And I discovered that I wasn't ready. In the assessment session with this panel, a panel of three existing experts, I failed. Now, we talk in the Agile community about how failure is a gift and we learn from failure. And we also know that failure is not fun. But my own experience of failing and learning from that failure and the, and the, the deep feedback and the very, very caring feedback that that community, that, that group of experts gave me. They gave me clear advice of, as to where I had fallen short. And they, they pointed me to this is what you need to go and do to, to build that deliberate practice to attain the, the skills and competencies. And I went away and I did it. I followed their advice. I built my, built up, got some more experience practicing, working with teams. And in July this year, I went back and I did it again and I passed. And this certification, this assessed by a group of my peers as an expert in this space is something that is deeply meaningful to me because it's not about knowledge. It's about showing the competency in the presence of a group of existing experts and getting the feedback from them that, yes, I'm good enough. And by the way, here are more opportunities to learn. And that's been a, a wonderfully fulfilling role, a wonderfully, wonderfully fulfilling journey. And this journey continues. Who knows where it will take me? So that's my experience. And I encourage you to think about what will your journey be? What are you going to take away from this session? What are you going to think about doing differently from tomorrow? Thank you very much. So, uh, Sean, are we doing? Hi. I think uh, we have a few certain questions for you. Fire away. Yes, uh, the first question is from Pranav. Um, he's asking, hello, Shane, greetings. Need more explanation on difference between coaching and mentoring. Right. So in the, um, 
learning outcomes, they distinguish very clearly. Mentoring is a practice where you work with an individual and you do provide advice and you're often sharing your experience in order to um, give them examples to draw from and learn from. So there's a, there's a teaching element, but you're not directing. You are still sharing your experience as something that they can consider. Whereas coaching is focused on the coachee probably has the answer for themselves. And as the coach, you're using tools like powerful questioning to help them expose that answer and bring it to the fore. So the, the coachee owns the solution, owns the decisions. The mentee in the mentor relationship is drawing on you for advice. And they will then make their own decisions, but they, they are looking to you for advice and guidance. Whereas as a coach, they're finding the solutions for themselves. And that distinction is really, really important because we want as much as possible people to own their own outcomes. All right. Uh, thank you, Shane, for answering Pranav's question. And uh, we have a couple of questions from Uma Shankar right now. Um, how is agile estimation differ from traditional estimation? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would say that that one sits right outside of the scope of the, of the conversation we've got here. Um, but uh, I would point you to the work by Woody Zool. Um, uh, have a look at the concepts of agile and adaptive planning um, for a good resource for that, I would go to the Agile Alliance website and, and actually look at estimation and planning on the Agile Alliance website. Uh, that's a deep and long topic that would be a, a webinar all on its own. Sure, I think we can plan that, right? Cool. Yes, I think, Uma, uh, your question was answered for that. But then Shane, Uma Shankar has another question for you. That's, uh, can we use agile methodology in non-IT industries? Absolutely. Uh, the, if you look at the, the work of the Business Agility Institute, it's all about how do we take these ideas and apply them in the, in the broader world. Um, and if we go back in, in the recent history, most of the ideas that the Agile Manifesto was based on actually came out of other industries. A lot of the work um, from people like Deming, um, a lot of the work from the Toyota production system, these are all things that influenced, and that work is carried on in parallel. Now, the IT industry grabbed some of it, and we've got the, the Agile uh, the, the Agile Manifesto, the values, the principles, and we've codified it because that's something we're good at as technology, uh, technologists is codifying it. And now we're starting to spread it back. Um, in the IC Agile world, we have business agility foundations. We have um, certifications in Agile marketing. Um, we have Agile talent. There's a leadership certification, and we're busy with, uh, with finance because these are all areas that organizations need to explore as they adopt the adaptive ways of working. So anywhere where knowledge is the primary source of value, the agile principles, values, and practices can be applied effectively. Okay, uh, that was an elaborate explanation. Thank you, Shane, so much for that. Uh, we are you know, flooded with questions right now. Uh, I'll take up the next question from Jeremy. Um, it's, can you recommend any path to get practice coaching when it isn't really a part of your job? <laughs> Volunteer. <laughs> 
work with your colleagues and offer your help. You know, I worked with a, a non-profit organization and I offered my services to them for free in order to get some coaching experience they had an existing coach who was providing them support. So we partnered, we paired a lot of the time and he provided me with the, with a mentoring relationship, which, which really helped um, find a mentor, find somebody and then, yeah, just offer your services, be generous of your time. All right. Thank you again. Uh, let's move to the next question from Balaji. Uh, can you list one big challenge you have faced when coaching team? Oh, <laughs> I can list many, but one of them uh, that jumps out at me was a team who were really doing well in, the old, in their old ways of working. They were happy. They were very content with their old ways of working um, and they were successful. But the organization needed to step up to a different level. They, uh, they needed to accelerate their time to markets. Um, and they, you know, they, they, were, they were building successful products. So this wasn't a burning platform. It wasn't a crisis, but this was we need to get better. So the, the really interesting challenge there was motivating working with these people who are being, who are successful and giving them some good reasons and some good support to get outside of that successful comfort zone and actually try some practices that they'd never done before and some things that were quite scary because they they were very used they were a very siloed team they were they were very very collaborative but they had very narrow specialized skills and their their handoffs were very very quick so they were they weren't a lot of bottlenecks you it wasn't the sort of problem that you see uh in in many organizations where that that traditional way of working was is gets in the way these were these people were doing it really really well and highly collaboratively and we needed to to help them think about becoming much more cross-functional uh and less siloed that was a that was a really interesting challenge because it was such an unusual situation most often you're going in and the teams are struggling with the old way of working they're not seeing the outcomes that they hope, but these people were really successful and wanted to do better. Um, okay. Well, thank you once again, Shane. I think we still have a few minutes so we can take a few more questions. Is that okay with you, Shane? Yep. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, let's take this question from Gopa Kumar. You know, uh, his question is, could you little uh, elaborate a little if there is any convergence between design thinking principles and agile coaching? And second point, mm -hmm. why you say it as agile coaching and not coaching? Why qualify? Right. So I'll answer that one first, if I may. Professional coaching is a professional skills area. Agile coaching is a subset of that, but also adds to it. And if we, if we go back to the framework that Lisa provides us, it adds to, a, to it the um, additional areas of being an agile lean practitioner uh, and bringing in the, the, the facilitating teaching mon uh, mentoring. So that that's, it's a it's professional coaching and agile coaching. Where does design thinking fit? It is a set of practices and to a certain extent a philosophy that aligns well with agile thinking. So for me, 
if I look at this, this uh, framework here, design thinking fits squarely in the business mastery area. And it is something that does fit with the agile ways of thinking and working. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Shane. Uh, I think we have another question, which is similar. I think Akshay Jain, his question is similar to the previous answer, which um, Shane gave. But then if Shane could elaborate on his question once again. Akshay's question is, how much proficient should a coach should be with respect to competence shown in butterfly diagram? For example, should a coach be technically sound to become an agile coach? Or can he have certain amount of knowledge? Same for business competency. Should a coach be business expert as well? A coach, in my opinion, needs to be deep in one of those three areas and at least aware of the key elements of the other two. If I think of myself, my depth is in the business mastery space. I'm able to talk in the technical space, and I understand some of the key elements of the transformation, uh, the, the organizational design, uh, business change motivation, and so forth. But if I'm my, my depth and the area where I can bring the most value to a team in, in terms of my mentoring teaching capabilities is in that business mastery space. Okay. Um, thank you, Shane. I think we can still ask for a few more questions. Uh, yes, we have a question from Krishnandu. In today's business, in today's dynamic business practice, are we able to do coaching practically? The most successful organizations have full-time coaches. So yes, because it's about supporting the team. And if we think of the, 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 the analogy, we call the role the coach. You would never have a sports team, a professional sports team, without a coach. And in fact, without multiple coaches who are coaching the teammate, the teams on the different disciplines. And the most successful organizations are the ones that recognize that it is important to build in capacity for the organization to learn. And a big part of that is providing both the time and the competencies. And the, the services of the coach are about creating that learning organization. Organizations that are too busy and that focus on 100% um, utilization and uh, want people to be working as hard as possible all day long are the ones that actually fall over and fail in today's modern world. Well, um, I hope, uh, Krishna, your question was answered. Um, moving to the next question by Ravi Kiran. It's a pretty interesting question from my point of view. Uh, the question is, what are the certification you would recommend for other slices, please, uh, like transformation mastery, professional coaching? Well, for professional coaching, I would look at one of the ICF, the International Coaching Federation certifications. For transformation mastery, I would look at the enterprise coaching track from IC Agile as a starting point. Um, and then uh, some of the... Uh, the organizational design, and, and I can't remember the, organiza the, the, the organization responsible for the organization design community, but Diana Larson is, is deeply engaged in that, in that community now, and that's very much about organizational transformation. But I'd start with the, the enterprise coaching track from ICA, Agile. 
Okay. Okay. Um, I have a pretty interesting question, Shane, from mm -hmm. Prakash. Um, how should a coach engage with a team who is not keen on accepting a coach? The leadership wants a coach, but the team is not welcoming. Should the mm -hmm. coach coach impose himself on the team? My feeling in that regard is no. It's go to the team. You're a servant leader. You're there with an offering. If the team is not ready to receive that, then maybe explore with them. Why not? And they might have very valid reasons. Uh, if the if coaching is being seen as some way to um, remove a flaw in the team, but what the team sees are organizational level blockers, then maybe my role as the coach is not to work with that team, but to work with the team's managers and create the safe space first and then go back and work with the team. But start with the conversation. Okay. That pretty much answers uh, the current situation, what Prakash might have been facing. Um, yes, I think uh, if anybody else has a few more questions, I think I have answered, I have asked, or Shane has answered most of the questions over here. Uh, most of the questions I found out to be common, so I skipped those questions. So, uh, any other questions from anybody right now? We're still having a few more minutes. Shane has a few more minutes, <laughs> though the session will be lasting for a couple of more hours. So, any questions? Okay, we have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you practice agile coaching if you have a small team of three to four people and don't have an opportunity to expand? Practice on each other. Be open to supporting and practicing on each other. And then again, look for volunteer opportunities. Talk to other teams and maybe look outside the organization. Okay, that's great. Um, I think, yes, uh, we are already running out of time and we, are, we should be getting ready for the next session as well. And thank you, Shane. Thank you so much for your expertise. You're sharing your knowledge with us and spending time with us. And yes, for regarding these slides, you can connect with me. Uh, for the slides, and as Shane has informed, you can connect, uh, you can get the slide on slide share as well. Yeah. So, if you have any other further questions, you can forward it to me, and I will forward it to Shane, and we can get it answered for you. Okay, thank you, right. Shane. Pleasure having you here with us today. Thank you very much, folks. Bye bye. Bye.